Okay, a woman, a little upset because her husband was late coming home again, decided to leave a note to him saying, I've had enough and I've left you. Don't bother coming after me. Then she hid under the bed to see what his reaction would be. After a short while, the husband comes home and she can hear him messing around in the kitchen before he comes into the bedroom. And so as he walks into the bedroom, as she's under the bed, she can see his feet as he approaches the bed, and she, she hears him pick up the note. After a few moments, she hears him go to the dresser and reach into the pin jar and grab a pen, and she begins to, he, she, she hears him begin to write something on the, on the note that she had left him. After a moment of that, he picks up his phone, and she hears him speak Hey, she's finally gone. Yeah, I know it's about time, but I'm coming to see you right now. We can finally start our life together. He hung up, he grabbed his keys, and he left. Well, the wife is devastated. As she hears the car drive off, she comes out from under the bed. She's seething with rage as tears are pouring down her face. And she walks over, over to, the, to the dresser where the note is, and she grabs the note to see what her husband wrote. And the note said... I can see your feet. We're out of bread. Be back in five minutes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and that's a couple that's been married a long time. Praise the Lord. Well, we're in a marriage series right now called For Better or For Worse, and we're going to be wrapping it up today. If you've been enjoying this series, hopefully you've learned a thing or two about marriage, uh, what to do and maybe what not to do. Praise God. Next weekend, make sure you're here. It's our annual Thanksgiving outreach. We're providing a free Thanksgiving meal to our community, to everybody that comes. We would love for you to join us. We would love for you to be here. It's truly going to be a great day. Years ago, we started doing this outreach on Thanksgiving, but then we realized... Uh, not a whole lot of people were coming, but I think because a lot of other churches and organizations in town do Thanksgiving meals on, on Thanksgiving Day, which is wonderful. So the need wasn't really there. So we decided to, hey, let's move it to Sunday morning, right after service. We'll give people a chance to hear the gospel, and, and that's better anyway. Give us a chance to throw some, throw some seeds. So that's what we've done, and now it just keeps growing every year. And a huge thank you to Jen Harkins and the crew for all their hard work on that and pulling that off. And then about a month from now, it's our great toy giveaway. Our goal is once again to give away a 1,000 toys on this stage to the children of our community. It's going to be a wonderful day as well. A lot of exciting stuff coming up as we're heading into Christmas. Okay, if you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 27. We also have these notes on the YouVersion Bible app if you follow along there. Um, but if you don't have your Bible, you can simply follow, up, follow along on the screen as well. So here we go. Just a couple verses today. We're going to go through several verses, but we're just going to start with a couple. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. And this is Jesus talking. He says, You have heard the commandment that says, You must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I'm calling this message this morning, How to Protect Your Marriage. Father, for the next few moments, I ask that you would give me the mind of Christ as we discuss this very important topic. God, I just ask today, unless you anoint these words, God, these words will fall flat. They will be meaningless. But God, if you anoint them, they have the power to change and transform lives. And so God, that is my prayer today that marriages would be restored, marriages, God, would be healed, and, they, and we would experience marriage the way you intended us to experience it. And so, God, we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus chapter 20 lists what we know as the Ten Commandments. They were the commandments given by God to his people. The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The final six deal with our relationship to other people. Commandment number seven talks specifically about adultery. Exodus 20 and verse 14 simply says you must not commit adultery. Now adultery is the act of having relations with an individual that is not your husband or your wife. But the, the amazing thing about this is commandment 10 takes us a step further. 
Commandment number 10 tells us that not only is the physical act of adultery wrong, but just thinking about or wanting it is wrong as well. Exodus chapter 20 verse 17 says you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor, to your neighbor. Jesus solidifies this teaching in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27 which we read just a minute ago. This again, this is what he says. He says, "You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. That's commandment 7." But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That is commandment 10, coveting. The word for covet in Exodus chapter 20 literally means to pant after. Jesus himself says that if we look at someone, and this applies to men and women both, if we look at someone with lust, we have already committed adultery in our heart. Adultery always starts with a look. I've talked about this in other messages before. But it starts when we take our eyes off of what we have, off of what's in front of us, and we begin to focus on something we do not have. It starts when we look at how the lady in the office treats us and we say, boy, she treats me so much better than my wife does. It starts when we look at how the guy in the gym treats us and we say, boy, he really understands me. My husband doesn't understand me the way this guy does. It starts with a look. The look is the door you open giving the enemy full access into your marriage. And our culture now glamorizes, defends, and even promotes this. As a matter of fact, there are websites now that are built to encourage people to have an affair. One website in particular uses the slogan, life is short, have an affair. Years ago, real website, years ago, Elle, a popular magazine among women, released an article that stated, an affair can be a sexual recharging, an escape from a worn out relationship away into something better. Harper's Bazaar magazine said women's marriages are improved by their affairs. Not according to research, but hey, what do we know? We also see this and promote we see this promoted in television and movies. As a matter of fact, a recent study showed that 7, listen to this, 7 out of 8 of the sexual encounters on in TV and TV dramas involve extramarital relations. Why? Because that gets ratings more. We are being bombarded with lies from different places, and they're so frequent that if we're not careful, we can begin to believe those lies. The lie that says life would be so much better if I was with someone else. It's a lie. As a matter of fact, the statistics say that 75% of marriages that were born out of an affair end in another divorce. Three out of four marriages that start with an affair end with another divorce. I guess the grass isn't always greener on the other side. I bet if I would ask you, every one of us in this room has been Uh, has been impacted by this in some way. We could name someone, we could name an individual, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's happened to you, that has fallen for this lie. No one is immune to this. I'm not immune to this. You are not immune to this. And we all know, like I said, we all know people. We Politicians have fallen, celebrities have fallen, friends and family have fallen, even pastors that have fallen to this lie. No one is immune from this. Proverbs chapter 5 and uh, Proverbs, Chapter 5 and verse 3 says this, For the lips of an immoral woman are are as sweet as honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is as bitter as poison, as dangerous as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to to, to death, her steps lead straight to the grave. For she cares nothing about the path to life, she staggers down a crooked trail and doesn't realize it. So now, my sons, listen to me. Never stray from what I'm about to say. Stay away from her. 
Don't go near the door of her house. If you do, you will lose your honor and you will lose to merciless people all you have achieved. Strangers will consume your wealth and someone else will enjoy the fruit of your labor. Basically, you're going to lose everything if you go down this road. In the end, you will groan in anguish when disease consumes your body. You will say, how I hated discipline. If only I had not ignored the warnings. Oh, why didn't I listen to my teachers? Why didn't I pay attention to my instructors? I have come to the brink of utter ruin, and now I must face public disgrace. This is the danger of adultery. It looks exciting. It looks fun. But the reality is it leads to death. After this man's life has been ruined, he says, man, if only I have listened, my reputation has been destroyed. This decision has ruined my life. People treat me differently. Proverbs 5 and verse 15 says, drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. Verse 18 says, let your wife Be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Simply put, an affair will destroy your life. And people tend to think, hey man, this this truth don't apply to me. This is going to be different for me. But then it it becomes too late. We we, we have this tendency to think the rules just don't apply to me and it's going to be different. For instance, if you're in a car and you're traveling 80 miles an hour and you do go into a curve that says 25 miles an hour, and you keep traveling 80, you are going to flip your car. Even if you think the speed limit sign doesn't apply to you, you're going to flip the car. Even if you're listening to Christian music, even if you have a Jesus bobblehead on your dash, and a honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker on your bumper, you're going to flip that car. You see, the speed limit sign is there to protect you from danger. Just like the signs we see here in the book of Proverbs. God gives us direction and instruction in his word because he loves us and he wants to protect us from ruining our life. I've heard people say that I don't follow God because there's just too many rules and I can't have any fun. It's no fun following God. It's just the opposite. His rules are there to protect us. He says, do not commit adultery for a reason. It's because it will not only destroy us, it'll destroy those that are closest to us. It'll destroy our children. So how do we protect ourselves against this? There's actually several things that we can do, um, but today I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm only going to give you, I can give you several. I'm going to give you three things that Kyla and I have done. We've been very, very faithful in these three things to keep our feet on the right path. So, um, number one, keep your relationship exclusive. Now, this one is very important, and it's ignored by so many people. And you can, you can tell that because of the stats of pornography that we see and different things like that. This one alone can protect you from the affair. Remember, Jesus said that if we look at someone with lust, we've committed adultery in our heart. Again, this is where it starts And so we have to be very, very careful with what we allow our eyes to see. Sometimes in life, things are unavoidable. I get that. There's images all around us. There's billboards. There's TV, et cetera. And we can't control an image that pops up in front of us a lot of times. But we can control what happens after that. When it pops up, do I turn my head and look away or do I continue to gaze? And it's my choice. In relationship, in relation to the eyes, pornography has been proven to be one of the most devastating things to a relationship. When we allow ourselves to gaze upon fake images, and they are fake, research will tell you that, most of them are airbrushed, we begin to compare our spouse to something that is actually fake. And this is true for both men and women. We have to protect the eye gate. There is no such thing as an innocent gaze because one gaze will lead to two and two gazes will lead to four. That's where it starts. But keeping our marriage exclusive doesn't just pertain to our eyes, it also pertains to our words. And what I mean by that is don't complain 
about your marriage problems to other people, especially people of the opposite sex. Now, if you're talking about your marriage problems to a counselor, you're trying to get help, that's much different. You know our story. Kyla and I had to get help on four different occasions because she had a lot of stuff that we needed to get fixed. And so we went to a, to a counselor. Four times. No, I, I have my stuff too. But that's okay. You're trying to work through things together. But here's what I did not do. And I'm so glad I got this right. I didn't go to some buddies at work and start crying, man, I'm just getting sick of all this nagging. That's all I hear, just nag, nag, nag. You see, that's dangerous ground because more often than not, you're going to hear a reply from one of your quote, unquote, friends that goes like this, yeah, man, that's women for you. I told you, you were better off not getting married. And we take that information and we begin to believe it. And then it becomes about me. And we begin to tell ourselves, you know what? They're right. I deserve better. Baloney. The truth is, I don't deserve anything. That's the spirit of entitlement, and it's thick in our culture. You see, it becomes about me. What I deserve. I want to tell you who deserves something. My wife deserves something. My wife deserves to have a husband that is a man of his word and someone that will honor the commitment I made to her before God and before others. I owe her that. I'm not owed anything. And you see, when you have this mindset, it shifts things within you. Because rather than saying, how is my spouse going to meet my needs, it becomes How can I meet the needs of my spouse? And when you both have that mindset, it's beautiful. But unfortunately, it's more me, me, me. They're not doing this for me. They're not doing this for me. Instead of what can I do for her or him? So keep your marriage exclusive, both with your eyes and with your words. Number two. Stay alert when times are good. I want you to look at this, Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1. This is is a remarkable truth to me, and you're going to see how how often. I've even got to check myself on this because this 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 one's difficult for me to live. Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1 says, Ask rain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain. Now, this is interesting because, but I really believe this is going to help some of you because this really helped me. Even though it's tough to live, it's it's very helpful. God is telling us here to pray for rain in the season of rain. We don't typically pray for rain in the season of rain. We don't typically pray for rain when it's raining. When do we start praying for rain? We start praying for rain when there's a drought, when there's a problem. We pray for rain when our situation looks hopeless. But here God says, no, I want you to pray for the rain while it's raining. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen someone walk out into the middle of a rainstorm and begin to say, God, send the rain. It's already raining. But look at what God is saying. He says, I don't want you to wait for a drought to pray for the rain. I want you to pray for the rain during the rain. Now, why does he ask us to do this? Because he wants us to be aware of a very important truth. And that truth is the fact that God doesn't want him to take us to take him or his blessing for granted. God says, I want you to pray for the rain while it's raining. Don't think that just because it's raining now, that you're going to have rain in the future. Don't take rain for granted. One of the greatest things I've learned in life is just because it's happened before doesn't mean it's going to happen again. Just because we've had success in a certain area of life does not mean we're going to have the same success again. Don't take it for granted. I would dare to say that if we would pray for rain while it's raining, as much as we do when we're in a drought, we would never see the drought. 
If you read the Bible, you'll see that one of the ways that God would get people's attention is by withholding the rain. As a matter of fact, if you read the Word of God, you'll see that oftentimes rain was a symbol of blessing. When God would send the rain, that's because they would, the, the people would have his favor. They would have his blessing. I remember when we left Phoenix to come to Green Bay. We were still in Phoenix. We'd accepted the position to come to Green Bay. We'd not moved here yet. And a group of people invited us to come over to their house. And so we all gathered together and they say, man, we just want to pray for you. We want to pray God's blessing over you. This group of people who we love very much just gathered around us and started praying for us. And the next thing you know, this huge thunderstorm moves in. And this is Phoenix. That doesn't happen very often. I think the last time they got rain there was when, when Noah had the flood or somewhere around in there. But it just, it didn't, things like that didn't happen. And as they prayed, this rainstorm, this heavy, heavy rainstorm came in, and we just thank you, God, because it was a symbol of God's favor and God's blessing. I don't want God to withhold the rain in my life to get my attention. I want it to keep on raining. Let me tell you, the time to pray for good health is when you're healthy. Most of us never do that. We take our health for granted, and then as soon as we get sick, what do we do? When my back went out last Sunday, I wasn't thanking God for a strong back before that. But as soon as it went out, boy, I was, you betcha. But that's typically what we do. We're not proactive, we're reactive. Don't wait for your health to turn bad before you start praying. Pray while you're healthy. When you're healthy, say, God, thank you for giving me good health. Continue to give me good health. Continue to give me a strong body. Continue to give me a strong heart so I can continue to serve you and make a difference and win people to your kingdom. He wants us to pray for financial health while we're prospering, not when the bank account runs dry. To ask for joy while we are joyful. Ask for a good marriage. Ask for the blessing of God on your marriage while things are good. Don't wait for a drought to pop up in your marriage and then start to pray. But that's what many of us do. Pray to God now. If your marriage is going good, thank God for that. Don't take it for granted because tomorrow's not guaranteed. It's sad but true. How many good husbands are taken for granted? How many good wives are taken for granted? You see, over the years, I've seen and heard quite a bit, especially when it comes to marriage. I've heard ladies that complain about their husband. They say things like, man, he's just so worthless. He's lazy. And they complain, and they complain, and then they split up, and suddenly her world is falling apart, and she's a complete mess. This is why we pray for rain while it's raining, so we continue to understand how blessed we are. We keep our focus on the rain. Ladies, this, helps, this thought process helps you keep winning him like you did years ago. If you keep winning him like you did when you first met, you're going to keep on having him. You should work hard, just as hard now to win him as you did when you were trying to have him give you the ring. And all the guys are saying, amen, pastor, keep preaching. This is the best sermon you've ever preached. But now it's your turn. God wants you men to do the same. Remember what it was like when you were dating? You would open the doors for her. You treated her like a queen. You would take a bath, brush your teeth, and comb your hair. Even put on a little deodorant and splash the brute cologne on. Amen. That's my wife's favorite, brute cologne. (laughs) It's an inside joke. Maybe that's going a little too far. But you know what I mean? Don't forget the wife of your youth as we read in Proverbs. So many guys, when they get married, they stop doing the things they did to win their spouse. And I'm guilty. I'm speaking to myself here, guys. I need to splash the brute cologne on from time to time as well. (laughs) But I shave my head so I don't have to comb it. I don't have to worry about that anymore. But pray for a good marriage when times are good. Because if you wait till you're on the rocks, it might be too late, and you've taken them for granted. And the, the thing about this truth is we can apply this to anything in our life. Don't take good friends for granted. You don't know how long they're going to be there. Don't take your kids for granted. 
Don't take your job for granted. Some, some people have a great job and all, and then you just complain. Don't take your church for granted. Don't take for granted the fact that you have a pastor that tells the best jokes in the city. I mean, that's a blessing. <laughs> Amen. Don't take that for granted. You know, speaking of taking your church for granted, I was, as I was putting this together, I was reminded of this. I thought about this. But I, I think about back to the time Shortly after we arrived here, we did our very, uh, very first big event here, and I think about all the people that showed up to that. Hundreds of people lift their hand, lifted their hands for salvation. If you were here during that time, you remember that. And I remember after that service hearing that several of our church members were in the back of the auditorium weeping at what they were witnessing that day. They had never seen anything like that before. They had envisioned it, but they never seen it. As a matter of fact, one of the men that helped lay the brick in the side walls in this building that you're sitting in right now told me that we are now seeing come to pass what they envisioned when they would come in those late nights and lay the brick, brick by brick, doing that backbreaking work. What's happening now is what they seen 20 years ago when they did that. It's coming to pass. The growth we've experienced. I remember the days when we first got here. We were lucky to have 70 people in this massive building. All of the side aisles were roped off. Some of you probably remember that. They were because we we're trying to push people together, so it felt like it was more full. I know some of you remember that. And we're running now, counting the kids, more than 400 on a regular basis. And the amount of people that are getting saved every week, that's what I'm most excited about. A number's just a number, man. Who's getting saved and baptized? It's amazing to me. And I think of some churches and people tell me, we didn't see one salvation all year. We didn't see one. And what God is doing here, it's truly remarkable. But here is why I tell you this, because we've become used to it now. And the miracles that once stirred our soul have become commonplace to many of us, and we've begun to take the miracles of God for granted. We've seen it all before, and the newness wears off, and we start to ask, what's next? But this is the time we need to pray for more rain. God, bring in more. There are thousands of people in this city that don't know you. Bring them in, God. Bring them in. Give us more lost souls into this building than we've ever seen before. I'm telling you, don't take good times for granted. Pray for rain in the season of the rain. Stay alert when times are good. And this is true, again, for every area of your life. And number three, uh, Kyla has talked about this in another message, so important. She's made reference to this. Date your spouse. This one is so overlooked. In the dating years, guys, we're good at this. That's how we're getting to know our spouse. We're taking them on dates, man. We go out of our way for them. We alter our schedules for them. But then something happens over time, especially when the kids come along. We forget about the importance of dating our spouse. So we have, this is something we've always done in our marriage. We, we were just given some good advice early on and we took it. We've always made it, a, made it a point to date each other and we usually go out once a week. Now this could be any time. Sometimes it's usually we go out for breakfast because that works best for us, but maybe yours is an evening Maybe it's a Monday night, Tuesday night, whatever. But the key is to pick something and stay consistent with it. There's going to be curveballs. Sometimes we can't go out. There's a curveball that's thrown. But that's the exception and not the rule. It is a priority. And we make it a priority. And we have, we've done that for years. Stay consistent. Now listen to me. If you have small kids... This can be extremely challenging because there is a thing called money you have to deal with. It's, easier, it's easy to say go on a date, but when you don't have any money, it's a little bit more difficult. I understand that. After child care and a meal or movie or whatever you do, man, you're, you're broke. <laughs> and I struggled with the same thing when my kids were young. 
but I received some advice from a pastor friend that really changed my life. He said, rework your budget, set some money aside every week for this occasion. This might mean you go without cable. It might mean you go without phone, but this is important. He said, here's the truth. Your kids won't care about cable if mom and dad end up separating. They're not going to care a lick about that phone either. They might care about it now, but if mom and dad separate, they're not going to care. They're going to want mom and dad back. They'd trade that for mom and dad back any day of the week. He continued to say, one day, listen, he said, one day, your kids are going to be out of your house. And if you don't stay connected with your wife, it is extremely difficult to get that connection back at that stage of life. I said, man, I get it, I really do, but it's so expensive. He said, you know what's expensive? Divorce court. Don't view this as an expense. View, and this was the perspective that changed my, my thinking on this, because I try to pinch pennies anywhere, and this was one of my one to pinch pennies. He said, view it as an investment. He said, if I offered to sell you 100 shares of stock that was guaranteed to double in a month, would you buy it? I said, of course. He said, what you spend on, an, on a day is not an expense, it's an investment. It's an investment into your marriage, and you will only win. And this advice changed my life. We didn't have a lot. Some nights we got a sitter for maybe an hour, because that's all we could afford, and we went for a walk around the lake. The only cost was a sitter. Maybe it was 10 bucks or whatever it was that night. Or maybe we would go out and we would get an ice cream cone. We would walk down to the McDonald's and get the get the ice cream cones for 50 cents or whatever they are now. I haven't had one in years, but inflation, they're probably eight, nine dollars right now. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, but be creative. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It's more the time that you're spending together. You'd be amazed what a little walk can do and just talking along the way. Sam, if you could go ahead and come on up at this time. Back in June, I posted this picture on social media and it just, it went nuts. I'm going I'm to show you this picture. Some of you might remember this. This thing was shared over 500 times. It just, it went, it went crazy. So many reactions. I don't think I've ever had a post go this crazy, but it's so true. And I want you to listen to this. It says, just a reminder that 75% of the time you'll ever get to spend with your kids is over by the time they turn 12. 90% of the time you'll spend with them is gone by the time they're 18. So slow down, be present, and enjoy these short, sweet years. They'll soon be over. Now, if you have teenagers or adult children, you know how true this is. This is hard to fathom when you're young and you have young kids. It's difficult because it feels like that's never going to end. But by the time they're 12, 75% of the time you've spent with them, generally speaking, is now over. And that's a tough pill to swallow, but what we've realized as our kids grow up, they start having their own life, they get a job, they start moving out. And contact becomes less and less frequent than when they're living in your home and you're spending all your time with them. So what does this have to do with dating your spouse? There's a reason I'm sharing this. What many of us do is we wrap, and if you, if you are a, a, a parent, married couple with small children, I really need you to listen to me here. What we do is we wrap our entire lives around our children and their schedules. And that's important because our job as parents is to lead and guide our children. God gave us that responsibility. But the issue is, is we become so consumed with our children, we neglect our spouse. Then, when our children are gone, which is going to happen, we no longer know how to connect with our spouse. Do you know that over one-third of all divorces in America are among those at the empty nest age. Double over any other age group. The empty nest age. More than double the divorces happen at this age than any other age. Because the husband and wife were so consumed with the kids and they're gone now and they don't know how to, that, that piece is missing. We've changed. We're different. It's gone. I cannot tell you how important this is. I'm amazed at the, the number of couples that ignore this advice. But this advice, the advice of dating your spouse, could very well be the advice that saves your marriage. 
because it forces you to stay connected. My kids are all getting ready to fly the coop now. And I would, I would have to say that our marriage today is probably stronger than it has ever been. My wife might say different, but that's what I say. It's stronger today than it's ever been. But I believe largely it's been in following this advice since our kids were just little. So recap, here they are again. Keep your relationship exclusive. Stay alert when times are good. Don't take your spouse for granted. And date your spouse. And that's how you protect your marriage. Could I have you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I just want to thank you for this series and the work that you've done in the marriages throughout these last four weeks. God, today I just speak over every marriage, those that are in this room, those that are watching online. God, maybe those that couldn't make it today because something's going on, but they've they've got some struggles, they've got some turmoil, they need a miracle in their marriage. You are the miracle worker. And so God, today, I just pray, Father, that you would kindle the fire of marriage in this church greater than it ever has been before. God, today we lift up every marriage to you. And God, it is my prayer by the power of the Holy Spirit that when we leave this place, God, you would continue to bring these truths to the forefront of our mind because it's one thing to come into a service like this and hear a message. It's a complete another to actually apply it and make changes. And so, God, I pray for that application now that we would apply this to our lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. I want you to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed.